Carrie. Hi. Thank you so much for joining me today. I'm so excited that we can sit down and have this hot seat interview here <laughs> at the museum. Um, I'd love to just start with an introduction. Can you tell me what you do here? Yeah, I am the collections manager in paleontology, so I'm kind of like the librarian, but for fossils. Oh, I love that. <laughs> uh, well, as our resident fossil librarian, um, have you always had this passion for paleontology, or is it something that you maybe developed later? Yeah, well, I always loved science. I uh, always I wanted to be an astronaut when I was little. Uh, but then I went to the mammoth site in Hot Springs, South Dakota when I was 12, and I saw all these fossilized mammoths. I met the head paleontologist there, and like from that day forward, I wanted to be a paleontologist. Oh, yeah, so it was, it, you, you just knew what you wanted, I knew and you what went and chased it. Oh, I love that. <laughs> With over 50,000 specimens in the paleontology collections, you have to have some of your favorites, right? Mm -hmm. Can you tell us about which ones you're particularly uh, fond of? I have so many favorites. <laughs> um, I love ceratopsian dinosaurs. They're my favorite. So our Cosmoceratops skull is just amazing. It's iconic. It's the best one in the world. It's a holotype, which means it's the first one of the species ever described. Wow. And it just has amazing ornamentations on the back of the skull. Uh, so that one's one of my favorites. I always show everyone who comes in collections Cosmoceratops skull. Uh, we also have an uh, Allosaurus uh, femur bone that has uh, has been permineralized or fossilized with amethyst inside. So it's like a bonus geode fossil where it's a dinosaur bone but with purple crystals inside. Okay, I, I want to talk about that one. <laughs> I love minute. that one. I want to talk about that. Did, when it was originally discovered in the field, did mm -hmm. we know that it had amethyst inside? Uh, yeah, that one actually had broken uh, in the field, like predepositionally, not like something that we broke or anything sure. like that. But that's the only reason we knew that it actually had crystals inside. So it's, it's really cool. Most things fossilize with quartz crystals, which is like clear or white. Um, but uh, amethyst is like a purple variety, and so it's just so pretty. Oh, that sounds incredible. I'd love to take a look at that. How do collections help the scientific community and the public in general in our understanding of prehistoric life? Yeah, so uh, I said that my title is like being a librarian but for sure. fossils. And I, I definitely feel that because I have researchers from all over the world come to our paleo collections and uh, look at all of our fossils. And so they physically come, they measure, they take photographs, they digitize, they, they make their observations in order to make publications. And so in that way, I'm kind of uh, facilitating science um, by making that research possible. And what's really neat with our digitization project is because it's all accessible online, uh, people can do that research from home. The specimens that we have in collections here at the museum, are they just Utah fossils? Uh, most of them, about like 80% of the specimens we have in our collections are from Utah, uh, but we also have fossils from like Nevada, Wyoming, um, South Dakota, um, that kind of stuff. Most, mostly of the places in America that have fossils, um, New Mexico, Nevada, <laughs> yeah. We got a good little selection. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Southwest represented. Indiana for some reason. <laughs> oh, hey Indiana. Yeah. <laughs> What about our collections going out to other institutions? Is that something that we do? Oh yeah, so that I, I feel like the collections is kind of like a revolving door sometimes because <laughs> I'm constantly mailing fossils to people. FedEx, of course, because that's yeah. the best. Um, <laughs> but if some a researcher can't physically come here to Utah to uh, research the specimens, I actually mail them out to those institutions. And so we have specimens in France and Germany and Japan and Argentina, like all over the world, so that those researchers can actually study the specimens in the comfort of their own labs. Oh, nice. We're so generous here at the museum. <laughs> yeah. Way to go. <laughs> <laughs> now, you do a lot of work here in collections, but you also do field work as part of your job. Can you tell us a little bit about what that process is like? Uh, yeah, I love going out in the field. So we have a really great field season that starts from March until October, and I get to go on some of those, which is really so much fun. Uh, I love going to Grand Staircase at Swanson National Monument. I was just on a dig a week ago, and uh, it's just wonderful to collect new fossils and actually see the whole fossil's journey from being the first person to see that fossil and then having it being brought back to the museum, cleaned in the prep lab, and then coming up to me in collections forever. I, I love that process. I have loved getting to know a little bit more about what you do here, but I want to dig a little bit deeper, pun intended. <laughs> we will be playing a game today called Never Have I Ever. All right, sounds good. All right. Question one. Never have I ever discovered a vertebrate fossil? I have. You have. Never have I ever discovered an invertebrate fossil? Have. Never have I ever discovered a plant fossil. Absolutely. <laughs> Question two. 
Never have I ever discovered a vertebrate, invertebrate, and plant fossil in the same day. Ooh, yeah, absolutely. Even on the same slab. What? <laughs> <laughs> Never have I ever broken a fossil that I've collected. Oh, yeah, I think we all have. Then, yeah, we've broken the fossil, and then all, not only that, we've glued our fingers to the bone as we're repairing oh, it. Right. Oh, great. <laughs> Never have I ever licked a dinosaur bone. Uh, all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Never have I ever licked a coprolite. Oh, I think I did. Because, like, there's some coprolites that have fish scales in it. And so I'm like, I wonder if the fish scales, you know, stick to your tongue. So I think I definitely licked a coprolite. You're right. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't smell or taste like poop anymore, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> Never have I ever directly caused a mass extinction. <laughs> uh, ooh. Well, I think humans are currently causing a mass yeah. extinction, but I don't think personally I am. <laughs> okay, that's, that's a relief at least. <laughs> Alright, never have I ever used a CT scan to see beneath the surface of a fossil. Ooh, well, we do take fossils to be CT scanned a lot to look at the different, like, the smaller bones, like the inner ear bones, and then also, like, the different density between the rock and the fossil. So we actually physically take it to be CT scanned, but we don't have, like, ground-penetrating radar or anything that we're <laughs> going into the ground in order to see where the fossils are. That's something Jurassic Park made up. Yeah, that, that would take all the fun out of your job, I right? That'd I make it too easy. <laughs> Never have I ever wanted to switch to archaeology. Oh, uh, no. I have not. I, I <laughs> did start out volunteering in the anthropology department, uh, so I do have a love for it, but I am definitely a paleontology girl. <laughs> <laughs> Never have I ever discovered a new species of dinosaur. Ooh, I wasn't the first one that discovered the new species, but I have worked on several new species when they're being excavated. Ooh, yeah. Does that just feel so humbling to just be a part of something like that? It's very cool. I, I One of the first digs I went on with this museum was when we were digging up the Echinocephalus um, Johnsoni, the armored dinosaur, that, uh, the ankylosaur that's armored everywhere, even his eyelids had armor. I was part of that dig. It was my first dig at the museum, and I found the tail club. And so the very iconic part of the dinosaur, of a new species, it was very cool to be the first, first person to see it, but also have it be so scientifically important. And, and to be the first person ever in history, of all the humans that have ever lived ever. for 300,000 years, you are the first person to see that. I, yeah. That is such an incredible feeling. It is very cool. Wow. Our behind the scenes theme this year is resilience. Mm -hmm. And I know you said you have a preference for ceratopsians. Is there any indication that ceratopsians have the ability to change and adapt to their environment? What kind of resiliency do we see in those animals? Oh, uh, that's a good question. So what's interesting and what a lot of people don't know is usually when they think of ceratopsian dinosaurs, they only think of triceratops. Like that's the most famous one, right? Yeah. But there are so many different species of ceratopsian dinosaurs, as you can see in our ceratopsian diversity wall. And what's neat about that is uh, they have done so many interesting things with their skull, um, whether they make it larger or smaller or have holes in them or not, um, to help um, with getting mates or for, you know, selection and that kind of a thing um, and so you can kind of see that with the evolution of ceratopsians from being small bipedal and then large and quadrupedal to adapt to their surroundings. What does the fossil record show in terms of surviving and extinction? What are we looking at when we're talking about that? Yeah so it's it's per animal really like some animals are completely untouched like they survive they're in the you know marine environment and they're just completely fine and others just don't they completely die every family every genera just completely dies and so it is like the case by case basis you know usually after a big um, mass extinction event like maybe after like mount st helens for example that like the entire ecosystem collapsed but then the first things to come back are like microbes bacteria <laughs> and then moss and then plants and then the larger animals that eat the plants you know then yeah. it then it all bounces back but it is definitely a case by case basis well, Carrie, thank you so much for joining me today. Before we wrap up, is there any big projects you're working on right now that you'd like to share? Oh man, what's really cool is uh, not only do we uh, go and find the fossils, but we actually have a lot of um, people donate fossils to us or like abandoned storage lockers that have fossils <laughs> in it or whatever. And so we actually have 
about like 6,000 fossils of two different collections that have uh, been given to us uh, in the last two years. And so I am slowly processing, <laughs> um, getting them numbered and housed and cataloged and curated to assimilate them into our collection. And so you asked how many fossils we had in the beginning, yeah. 65,000, well, it'll be more like 70,000 <laughs> tomorrow. <laughs> wow, that sounds like a lofty project, but if anyone can take care of it, I know that it's Oh, thank you. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Carrie. I hope we can do this again in the future. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks for having me.